Okay, I think we can start now. I uh, see plenty of people here waiting. Uh, welcome to DevConf 2022. Uh, my name is Andrei Veselov, and uh, me and Pavel Yaudlovsky will moderate this session. Uh, next up, we have uh, Ricardo Oliveira and Maulik Shah uh, speaking about data engineering for Java developers. Uh, this is the live session, and uh, there will be time for uh, questions at the end of the uh, of this session. Uh, please also use the Q and A section as well. Now I uh, let speaker uh, share his screen, and uh, please uh, begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Ricardo. I'm senior software engineer involved with the Open Data Hub project and the Rhodes product, the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, focused on AI ML solutions for cloud native, uh, for the open, uh, for the hybrid cloud uh, environments. Um, my main experience with uh, data, uh, speaking by, by itself, it's more about the engineering side and well i had this idea of doing this talk because i know that when we talk about data engineering uh, people always remember about python or r but there are room for any other um, plenty of other languages but i'll be focusing this one for java developers okay so Here's the agenda for this talk. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you uh, by showing some uh, demos that data engineer is not for a field. Uh, you can be a Java developer and still uh, working with data engineering. Uh, I'll show some Java tools focused on data engineering or even uh, APIs inside Java that could uh, be useful for doing anything to manipulate data. And Atlas will have the uh, ask me anything about the topic. Before we move on with the, the, the tools, uh, a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, this talk is based on my own experience with this related topic, uh, which means there might be other solutions that could fit better in some scenarios. But remember that these are all my experience and of course, I'm, I don't want the uh, absolute truth. Um, the main purpose of this talk is to show that uh, you can use whatever language you want uh, to understand techniques or methodology on data engineer data analysis uh, without the need of learning a new language. Uh, it's not because the majority of professionals use Python or R for data engineer or even AIML, uh, it doesn't mean you can do with your own language. Uh, and in this context, I'm talking about Java. So um, of course, I'm not here to prove that one language is better than the other, but of course, to show that there are ways for Java developers to go deep on, on understanding techniques and methodologies for data engineering uh, without knowing uh other languages uh on the other hand there's a need to um know the true the tools for data engineering to go deeper on techniques and methodologies so um well spoiler alert this will be all about tooling in this in this talk so there will be a lot of demos okay so Remember what I said, uh, when we talk about um, data engineering, people think about Python or R, but of course you can do the, you can do the same thing with Java, right? So um, this slide is just a bit of, of a parallel of the tools you can use with Python and which one could be a, a, a which technology or which tool can be used on the Java side. So uh, you have pandas to manipulate data 
in Java have the string API. Uh, you can use distributed pandas or PySpark. Spark can be used using Java too. Um, MongoDB has NoSQL, you have a Cassandra. Airflow for data pipelines, you can use Nephi or Argo workflows. And the latter is a cloud native solution. So um, for cl uh, hybrid cloud environments, uh, Argo workflows will be preferable. Uh, and speaking about Jupyter, there is one that can be used with, with Java and it's Java, uh, Apache Zeppelin, all right? Okay, so there's three APIs that was introduced in Java 8. So since Java 8, you can manipulate data using uh, Streams API and in a way that you can use all the process, uh, all the CPUs, uh, because all the processing is doing in multi cores. And also, you can do this using a very simple fluent API, fluent language. So let me show uh, a quick example here. Uh, that's a very simple class that it's get, gathering this US elections data set, which is uh, my personal curated data set for uh, the votes count for each uh, county in the US elections in the past three elections. So 2008, 2012, and 2016. Well, uh, I don't have it through 2020 yet, but I'll make sure to update this. All right. Um, let's focus on the good thing here. Yeah. There's this one, which um, take an example on how to use the uh, streams API. So the other uh, methods are just uh, downloading the the file from uh, a URL, um, and then it stores in my local uh, my local computer, and then I can open my file here, and then uh, I can use stream to process my data. So. The line 47, uh, it's skipping the header. Okay, it's better. Uh, it's skipping the header, and then I am mapping uh, these records to a class. Well, uh, Java is a object-oriented language, so because of that, we have this problem with, um, you know, you need to map everything to a class. So I needed to create this US elections item to make sure I'm mapping all the data uh, from the CSV file. Let's see how it works. Uh, basically, what I'm doing is uh, reading the CSV file, grouping them by the total votes by 2008 and, and make the sum of it. Let's run this guy. So okay. There should be one on ID. Let me try. Okay. With streams. Let's see. All right. So that's the results. This is the total votes of the Democrats, the Republicans, and for other parties. Okay. So that's a very simple example on how to use streams uh, with Java. Uh, moving towards to, uh, let's suppose we want to do pro data processing, but with a huge amount of data. And let's think that this could be in, in a batch or streaming fashion. Uh, both uh, depends on the scenario. But think about how to use uh, Java to process a huge amount of data. You can use Spark, as Spark has uh, very useful models, uh, including ones for machine learning. But uh, it it's very useful when you're handling uh, a huge amount of data, and you want to use this 
in a cluster to make uh, to make sure you have enough resources to handle gigabytes, terabytes of data, and so on. Um, here is a very simple example I'm doing with the same, but the difference here is that I'm just uh, printing the schema from the US elections data set. It's just a simple thing I did uh, based on the uh, here on the local US elections data set, okay? So I'm giving the Spark four gig of memory and two cores to run this task. It's way more than enough for just printing a, a simple schema. Uh, I'll get to this later, but think about uh, this one are important for logging, okay. Let's do this. Uh, let's run Maven with Spark. All right. Here, I would like to show something. Uh, when you're using Spark, uh, it exposes a port called 4040, so you can check what's happening with your uh, Spark application. So let's look at it. Uh, 4040, uh, oops, what happened? Okay, so here's what happened. Uh, if you have a, a Spark application that's running faster and it finishes, you don't know what happened. Uh, think about you are, uh, you are writing a Spark app and you have errors during the data processing. How can you take a look at that? Um, how can you debug this? Uh, if this uh, URL was published only during the Spark app execution, you need an additional tool for that. So let me show you something here. Uh, here, I, I'm in my Spark distribution. I'm going to the SP uh, and then I'm gonna run uh, a guy called the history server, all right? Um, oh, well, history server is already running, which is good. Um, I configured this Spark server to run on 28080. So what happens here? Um, I configured my uh, history server to, uh, to watch this path from the event log here, all right? And with that, I can track all the Spark applications that's running because if you take a look at the logs path here, it creates a log file for each application execution, right? So with that, you can go there and look at all the problems if, uh, if there are problems in your execution. Because it's just a print schema, it won't show anything, but for complex data processing tasks, it will show all the jobs and stages ran, uh, as well as how much memory it consumed for, per stage, per job, and so on. All right? Uh, this is just a simple example just, uh, to show how to use Spark for uh, distributed data processing, all right? Moving towards a NoSQL solution. So meet Cassandra, which is uh, one of the NoSQL uh, data stores using the approach of a big table. And one of the biggest, biggest things about Cassandra is that um, Cassandra is replicated replication native. So in order to have a stable uh, NoSQL database, you must use the replication scheme in Cassandra. So you need at least three instances of Cassandra so you can have your data replicated throughout the, the nodes. And with that, it's possible to make ensure that your data will be available no matter what happened. Uh, 
you have also uh, the advantage to use SQL as a query language as well as other things. All right. So that's my terminal. I believe I don't have Cassandra ready here, but let's let's check if I'm the right path. All right. So let's run Cassandra. And I will, oops, it's just a center. Okay. So Cassandra is running. Cassandra is already used because, yeah, that's because I already have Cassandra running. Um, okay, so moving on to this class, which I have a very simple example to create a key space and write data onto a Cassandra table, which I created for US elections. All right. Um, okay. Let me uncomment this. It's just another, it's just another uh, query I'm running to select all the, the dating table. Let's run this one. Okay. Let's see. Probably it will. Okay. Uh, this one was, was because of this guy. Where is, where is this one? Can be deleted. It was an attempt to uh, load other CSV file from Cassandra, but because Cassandra uses um, uh, the copy instruction is only for the C, the Cassandra query language, uh, and can be only used by the the CLI command, not by uh, Java or any client. All right, uh, sounds like I'm having problems here. What's happening? 85, codec not found. Okay, uh, let's see if at least I have something in my key space. Use my selections and then let's query everything from this guy. I'm very sorry to interrupt, but uh, it's just a reminder that it's uh, three minutes left. Just to let All you right. know. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So here we have some data which I created earlier, but I'm sorry, something happened with that code and it didn't work. But uh, that's okay. Uh, moving to the last two tools. Uh, so Nephi and Argo, uh, I won't show an example of it because I have a very simple scenario for data processing and Nephi and, and Argo are meant for doing complex data pipeline solutions, but just a comparison about Nephi. Nephi can be uh, used as a visual uh, data pipeline builder with many connectors available, uh, but the biggest disadvantage on it is that it's not yet a cloud native solution, which is different from the ARG workflows that can be built uh, data pipelines uh, declaratively using YAML and it's uh, K8 is native, right? Um, those one are tools that can be used to write, uh, you know, any complex data pipeline that needs to get from many uh, data sources um, and, you know, uh, doing uh, many uh, manipulations on the data, okay? Um, moving to the last two is the patch zeppelin, which is kind of a, a Jupyter 
that has lots of uh, subsystems available. So there are lots of kernel and it's good for dashboards too. All right. Um, okay. I have 20 seconds, but I'll, uh, I might need one more minute for that. So I'm, I'm sorry to, um, to use this uh, one minute more. Okay. So I believe I have exactly money here. Let me see. No, nope, I don't have. Okay. So let me get the admin. Okay. Uh, I'll need to get from the readme. So I'm going to run from what happened? So I'm, okay, let me do this, which is better. So I'm going to run uh, Zeppelin from a, a container, which makes things easier, but I'm mapping to my local path to show my, uh, my dashboard I created in my repository. So basically I'm using Spark, I'm, I'm using uh, Scala to load my CSV file and then I generate a table from it. With that I can use in other paragraphs which what they call these uh, small pieces here to query everything from the table or making uh, charts using a select statement, all right? Um, things that is good from uh, Zeppelin is that you can hide either the editor or you can, like, I'm hiding all the select statements and then you can move to a reporting thing. So look at the results. You can make a full dashboard by just using simple SQL and very small pieces of, of code. And there is already Spark connected in, into this uh, instance of uh, Zeppelin. So you don't need to know how to connect to Spark. You just need to use the Spark object available for Zeppelin. And I'm very sorry, I'm taking two minutes, but well, if you want to follow all the, the the demos I create I showed in this talk, you can just follow on the GitHub link I have here. Uh, there will be the data set I used, all the classes I showed, and there's also a readme file containing the instructions on how to execute the Zeppelin using my notebook as an example. All right. Uh, my Twitter is at uh, he will leave. Uh, sorry, uh, it's just a Brazilian way to, to say this username. I don't think it would be good if I use my English accent on it. Uh, there's my LinkedIn too. And well, I conclude my talk here. If you have any questions, all right. Thank you, Ricardo.